That night, my mom came to my bedroom and she told me, don't come out. In the morning, I looked out of my keyhole. My next vivid memory is I am out on the front porch and my next door neighbor is out there digging for worms. He says, Heidi, come here, I have to show you something. And I says, I can't. I think my mommy's dead. Loretta Jones's case takes us to the town of Price, Utah, United States. Price is the largest city in Carbon County with a population of less than 9,000 people as of the 2010 census. It offers a suburban feel for its residents, where most have their homes. Known for fascinating rock formations, vast desert, and yawning canyons, Price is a beautiful location for recreational opportunities. According to statistics, the chance of being a victim of crime in Price is about 1 in 56. And in this calm town, our story begins. Loretta Jones lived in Price at 468E, 400 South, with her four-year-old daughter, Heidi Jones. There, she thrived to make ends meet for herself and her daughter. She was unmarried and young, but she gave her all for Heidi, who recalled most of the beautiful memories they had together. Loretta made most of the clothes Heidi wore as a kid. Her dolls and they lived a happy life together. But soon, their happy life would end abruptly on the night of July 30th, 1970. On that warm summer night, Heidi kissed her mother goodnight, unknown whether it would be the last time she would see her alive. On the morning of July 31st, 1970, Heidi Jones woke up to see her mother, Loretta, lying lifelessly on the living room floor of their home. Heidi, who was too young to comprehend the whole situation, went out of the house. Outside, she saw her neighbor, Sue Ann Hovert, who was digging out worms at her apartment. Hovert on seeing Heidi beckoned her to come closer to ask her what she was doing, but Heidi replied to her saying, I can't. I think my mommy is dead. There was blood on the couch. There was blood on the floor. There was blood everywhere. Hearing these words made Hover immediately abandon what she was doing to follow Heidi in to check out the situation. In Loretta's home, Hover found Loretta lying face down, naked from the waist down, and her back and hair matted in blood. Hover called the police, and the police chief, Art Poloni, responded to the scene. After the police arrived around 11.40 a.m. on July 31, 1990, they confirmed Loretta was dead. They found blood everywhere in the living room, and Loretta had 17 stab wounds. The investigators didn't see any sign of forced entry, which suggested that she had known her attacker. Loretta also didn't have any defensive wounds, which showed she hadn't tried to defend herself during the attack. The medical examiner also concluded that Loretta was killed with a small, narrow knife and that she had bodily fluid on her. But unfortunately, DNA testing was still in its early stages at the time. There was no CCTV camera to capture how the whole thing went down. But since there was a little girl in the home at the time of the incident, the investigators turned to her to get some answers. Heidi told the investigators that after her mom had put her in bed, she returned to tell her not to come out of her room. She also said she never heard her mother scream or struggle on the night of the murder, but she did mention something that got the investigators concerned. Heidi had told the investigators that Tom did it. Tom killed my mom. The police began to search for answers as they combed the house. During the investigation, Heidi's grandma was jotting down everything Heidi was saying at that time. And there was a, an entry on this notepad on the morning that the body was discovered. Heidi told her grandmother it was Tom that killed my mom. Eventually, they found Loretta's diary and in it was a name similar to the name Heidi mentioned, Thomas Eagley. According to the diary, Thomas and Loretta dated for two months before her death, and that was the only information they could get on Thomas. There was little to nothing that the investigators could make out of the case, except for a name mentioned by a four-year-old Heidi, who was asleep at the time of the murder. 
but soon the police had another lead to follow. Around 9.30 p.m., Kulo Fennel, a 10-year-old girl who lived three blocks away from Loretta's house, was outside her house riding her bike with her brother. On seeing that it was already getting dark, Kulo's brother left his bike and went inside the house while Kulo was alone outside. She soon decided to go in as well, leaving her bike outside. As she walked to the main door, a man attacked her from behind, gripping her and covering her mouth with his palm. Luckily, Kulo was able to get her mouth out of the kidnapper's grip, and she let out a deafening scream. The man got scared and left Kulo to take to his heels. Kulo was able to see her attacker and also the direction he went. She told the police he ran in the direction of Loretta's house. Later at the police station, Thomas Igley's picture was included in a lineup, as he was already a suspect in a murder case on the same night. Kulo pointed out Thomas as the person who tried to kidnap her, and so Thomas was brought in for questioning. The investigators believed that the case of Kulo and Loretta were related. They questioned Thomas on August 1, 1970, based on the two incidences separately, and he denied his involvement in them. Thomas said on the night of the homicide, He hitched a ride with a couple of younger teens. He'd been dropped off in price at a little local fast food joint. He said he grabbed a burger and uh, sat down on the curb and ate it. He hitched a ride with some teenagers, and they later dropped him off when they got to Price at a fast food joint where he had hamburgers. He said he then went to a bar called Highway Rendezvous on Springland Road around 11.30 p.m., and after that, he went to his home. He said he didn't see Loretta that day. The investigators visited the bar to ask if they truly saw Thomas that night, and the owner of the bar confirmed that she saw him and that he was a bit skittish, nervous, and had red speckles on his shirt. Tom had red speckles on his shirt, and he said he had been painting red paint must have got on him. The investigators asked Thomas about the red speckles mentioned on his shirt, as he told them it must have been paint, as he had been painting all day. Regardless of his statement, the investigators collected the clothing Thomas told them he was wearing that night, and they collected his hair, blood, and fingerprint samples too. So the fibers that they discovered on Tom's clothing did match the fibers that were found to be similar to those on Loretta Jones's rug. With that, investigators believed they had enough probable cause to arrest Thomas, and they did. Thomas was arrested when he lived in a motel in Helper, Utah, with his girlfriend, who was eight months pregnant. But during the preliminary hearing on November 5, 1970, prosecutors brought in witnesses that provided an alibi for Thomas. The prosecutors said the fiber evidence was similar to the rug that Loretta had in her home. But that was not enough, as Thomas was known to have visited. Loretta in her home before the incident. However, because Kulo Fennel could identify Thomas as the man who tried to abduct her, he was charged with attempted kidnapping, and so he spent 90 days in jail. After Thomas's jail time, he was released back into society, and in 1971, Thomas moved to Rockford, Colorado. But still, Loretta's case remained unsolved. For years, Heidi dealt with the trauma of her mother's death. She would talk about the incident to her grandmother, who had immediately taken her in after her mother died. She continuously told her grandmother that she was unsure that Tom killed her mother, and everything Heidi said, her grandma wrote down in a journal. Heidi also told her grandmother that Tom always slapped and hit Loretta, and that he was always mean to her. Soon, the adults in the house tried to make Heidi forget about the incident, and stopped her from talking about it. Although Heidi stopped talking about it, she never forgot about what happened to her mother in 1970. As Heidi grew, she understood that Loretta must have endured the severity of the attack because she wanted to protect her and take him to the sheriff's office for questioning. Tom Egley explained to the police on the night of... And because of that, Heidi determined that she owed her mother justice and she would get it for her. Decades passed and Heidi moved on with her life, but never for once forgot about her mother's case. Although Heidi still held her mother in her heart, she didn't really push for the case to be reopened. But one day, Heidi was inspired by a TV show called Unsolved Mysteries. She started a massive letter campaign sending them to FBI, Price City Police Department, 
and Carbon County Sheriff, but none of them responded. Still, she continued to write one letter after another. In 2009, 43-year-old Heidi made a post on her social media, and one of her former high school friends, David Brewer, reacted to her post. The two reconnected after a long time, and during their conversation, Heidi learned that David was working with the Carbon County Sheriff. Heidi thought this was an opportunity for her to get her mother's case reopened. She tracked David and purposely ran into him at a local arts festival so she could talk to him about her mother's cold case. David granted Heidi the audience that she needed, and, in the end, after he had listened to her, David was moved by Heidi's story, and at the same time he was surprised that he had never heard of Heidi's story when they were in high school. Heidi narrated how her mother kissed her goodnight, and how the door of her room later opened to reveal her mom, telling her never to come out, as if she knew something bad was going to happen. That night my mom came to my bedroom and she told me, don't come out. She also explained how she believed that Tom had killed her mother. Heidi mentioned that though her memory was murky, she had a faint memory of what looked like Tom on her mother, either forcing her to be intimate with him or stabbing her. But what Heidi didn't hear was her mother scream. Hearing her story, David decided to help Heidi, and Loretta's case was finally reopened. David Brewer started to work on the case, but the odds were stacked against him. He tried to use the crime files, but they had been lost. All that he had was past media coverage and Heidi's murky memory. David tracked down Thomas, who was living in Rockford, Colorado, for more questioning. When he asked Thomas about what happened on the night of July 30, 1970, Thomas was able to give the details of what he ate and did on that day, but he said he couldn't remember Loretta or her name. At that moment, David was convinced that Thomas may actually be the killer, but since there was no evidence to convict him, David had to leave without arresting Thomas. David Brewer also tracked down Thomas's other than girlfriend, Marcia Hidalgo, to question her. Marcia told David that Thomas came home late the night of the murder, and he immediately took a bath with his clothes on. The next day, Thomas went to the laundromat, and when he returned home, she said Thomas was missing several clothing items. According to Marcia, she asked Thomas about his whereabouts, and he told her that he took hamburgers to a woman and her daughter. Although David could not really make something out of the information, he was more convinced that Thomas murdered Loretta. David had tried every other way, and the only thing he felt was left was exhumation, but he didn't know how Heidi would feel about exhuming her mother's corpse. But surprisingly, after David told Heidi of his thoughts, she said she would even get a shovel to dig the grave herself, if that would get justice for her mother. They proceeded with the exhumation, and there Heidi broke down so many times, but after the body was exhumed, they discovered water had damaged the whole body, so they could not get what they needed. However, they decided to exaggerate the outcome to the public by saying they had found new evidence that had provided them with a lead. Investigators in Carbon County say there are, they are closer than ever to figuring out who raped and killed a young mother nearly five decades ago. The news traveled far and wide, and soon, David would get a phone call from a woman named Linda. Linda explained that she remembered the information she saw in the news of the exhumation on TV and decided to share it with the investigators. She told David Brewer that Loretta had written the name of the killer with her blood. A surprise David asked her how she knew this, considering that police did not allow anyone into the crime scene. Linda explained that she lived at Heidi's grandmother's house when she was in high school, which was the time of the murder. A day after the incident, Heidi's grandfather asked Linda and one of Heidi's aunts to go to Loretta's house to pack Heidi's belongings. Linda said because of that, police allowed them in, and on getting there, she saw with her own eyes a capital T and an O. The whole name, she only got the T and the O out. Wow. That is, that is, that is heavy-duty stuff. I, I get goosebumps right now thinking about that. Loretta was trying to tell the story herself and help us out. And it looks like the last thing she did on this earth was write the letter O, and she couldn't get the M in there for Tom. This was a huge break in the case, 
but they needed a photo of the crime scene to prove this. David met with Heidi and explained the new information he got with her. David met with Heidi and explained the new information he got with her and also expressed his pain about not being able to lay his hands on any photos of the crime scene as all were lost. David said to me, too bad we don't have any photos of the crime. And right away, Heidi remembered that a photo might be in a box of belongings that her grandmother had kept all those years. They went ahead to search her grandmother's house for the box. And in the box they searched for the photo. All that was inside the box was everything that concerned the case, including the journal where her grandmother wrote all that Heidi had said concerning the case. However, the most striking item was a photo of Heidi standing next to the outline of her mother's body. The picture was a really disturbing one. Anyone would have questioned why they were taking pictures of young Heidi next to her mother's pool of blood. But it turned out this photo would be of great use in the future. In the photo was Heidi and her mother's blood, with the two letters T and O in it. David Brewer began to piece the puzzle together. Reading the journal, he saw that Heidi mentioned how mean Tom was to her mom and the fact that she told everyone that Tom did it. And the most important thing, Loretta was trying to write the name of her killer with her blood as she struggled for her life, and the last thing she could write was an O. But even with this photo, the detectives needed more to capture Thomas Eagley, who was now believed to be Tom in this case. The case came to a halt again, until someone decided to be of great help to the investigators. A woman named Lisa Carter called the police department to tell them she was Thomas Eagley's neighbor. She said Thomas came to her after she saw the exhumation video asking if she could watch his dogs as the police could come for him any time soon. Lisa Carter also believed that Thomas was Loretta's killer, so she offered to help in the case. She asked that the police allow her to wear a recording device to get Thomas's confession. The police agreed and an arrangement was made. Lisa approached Thomas and lied to him that her husband had been training to be a detective in Utah. She told Thomas that he had been a topic of discussion, as he was already known as the murderer of Loretta Jones. I said, I've known Tom 20 plus years. He said, Tom's kind of in a bad spot. And I said, what do they have? He said that they still had the swabs from the night of the killing that the people from the autopsy took. Well, I don't know how they could have DNA. All these words got to Thomas Eagley, but he didn't confess as he still couldn't trust Lisa. But after two days of trying to gain Thomas's trust, on July 26, 2016, he started to talk to Lisa about what happened on the night of July 30th, 1970. Thomas said he knocked on the door to Loretta's home and she let him in. He said he was in her house for intimacy, but Loretta turned him down, making him feel so worthless. Okay. And the door closed, and then what? What would you think happened? If you had to guess, what would you think happened? I would turn down for sex. Okay. And that made you feel how? Like, and then when she come back, I've stabbed her. He said Loretta left him in the living room to get something in the kitchen, and after she came back, he reached for a small knife and stabbed her. After stabbing Loretta, Thomas went ahead to get intimate with her, claiming that it was consensual. A confused Lisa asked how it was consensual after Loretta refused, but Thomas said throughout the time Loretta never said no to him. She then asked him what happened after, and he told her that after getting intimate with Loretta, he lost it completely, and that was when he slit her throat. So you remember having sex with her and then what? I lost it, I cut her throat, and I left. According to Lisa, Thomas said all these words without being sorry for all that he did. It appeared he only cared about his own safety. That confession was all the investigators needed to arrest Thomas. A 76-year-old man is on his way to prison for a murder he committed in Carbon County back in 1970. I can't believe this. I can't believe this day is finally here. Not much is known about Thomas Eagley, according to Loretta's sister, Carolyn Kendall. She only knew that Loretta dated Thomas one time, on a blind date. Loretta told Carolyn that she didn't like Thomas, so she didn't want to have anything to do with him. 
This explains why Loretta refused Thomas's advances that night. 76-year-old Thomas Eagley was a local drifter who had lived in many places before and after he murdered Loretta. He never had a stable home life. He lived with many women and had been married three times. He had five children, but spent most of his time by himself. In August 2016, Thomas Eagley was charged in the 7th District Court with the legal equivalent of first-degree felony murder, as well as forced intimacy, a first-degree felony. Thomas's official charge was criminal homicide murder in the second degree, which was a statutory offense that applied to killing at the time under Utah law. Thomas was arrested without incident in Rocky Ford, Colorado, on a $1 million warrant issued on August 18, 2016. Thomas pleaded guilty to the murder, and his assault case was dropped. He was then sentenced to 10 years to life on November 22, 2016. Thomas never passed a remorseful comment except a written statement read by his attorney, David Alred, which read that he was sorry for what he did, but that didn't seem true after Thomas expressed that he believed he should be let go, since he hadn't committed any crime since he killed Loretta. He said in court, that he could not understand why the family of the deceased chose to reopen a case of 46 years ago. It seemed like Thomas wasn't sorry for what he did, even after 46 years. According to Thomas, he didn't know that Heidi was in the room when he killed her mother. Loretta knew this, and it explains why she never struggled or screamed when he was stabbing her. Most likely, Thomas wouldn't have spared Heidi if he knew she was in the room. After he was sentenced, he complained to the judge that he didn't like his jail, which was the state prison in Salt Lake County, as it didn't allow visitors. The judge told him he could file an appeal. Heidi, who held in her pain for over four decades, had the opportunity to say all that she had in mind to her mother's killer. She expressed how traumatic the death of her mother was, and also spoke about how she wished Thomas Eagley would rot in jail and never have to see his loved ones again. She also said she'd make sure that he never walks free, even if he was eligible for parole after 10 years. Even though others called it closure, Heidi called it justice, saying nothing could give her the closure and relief she needed. The fact that justice was served meant everything to her. As we come to the end of this heartbreaking story of Loretta Jones's death, we are reminded that time does not heal every wound especially the wound of the heart. We are also reminded of the evil that resides in the heart of man. Looking back at the clean slate that Thomas Eagley had with the law, we are left with the thought-provoking question, like why he chose to orphan Heidi at such a young age. A quick question before we go. What do you think about how Loretta's case was initially handled? Do you think law enforcement would have done better considering all they had available at the time? If you have any comments or any other case you'd like us to cover on this channel, kindly suggest and share your thoughts in the comments section. We appreciate your engagement and look forward to more of it. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this channel for more content like this.